inside the startup studio. <laughs> okay, guys, so we have like uh, just one rule. Again, we have uh, microphones for you guys to ask questions. The one rule that we have is that whatever question that you guys ask, it has to be able to be answered by everyone on the stage. So, you know, not to uh, insider baseball. Ron, tell me about the new Brooklyn Nets arena downtown. Doesn't work out too well. That, that, that works great in New York, that joke there. Just, yeah, just, yeah, it kills. It works great. <laughs> okay, um, this is a question, and Gentry, you got into this, you answered it at the very end, but I wanna ask you guys briefly to answer this question, and Tyra, we know we're gonna hear more about you tomorrow, but I wanna hear each of your individual, your why, to what you're doing with notes. Oh, cool. Um, so for me, I mean, I think you, I, I talked for a second about the sort of origin story of where, where the pain point was uh, coming out of dealing with snap goods and the fact that we felt like we were not serving our users well by not helping them leverage their networks better. Um, for me, I mean, it, the ongoing pain point that actually was a precursor even to that was I spend so much time trying to figure out when I want to break into a new business uh, or examining a partnership um, or whatever. I'm looking on a page to figure out in the About Us section who I'm connected to. Who can make the warm introduction for me? I'm copying and pasting names. This is a year and a half ago. Um, every single name on a board of directors, every single name on a board of advisors, every single name on a team into LinkedIn, Facebook, looking up Twitter handles. Try that literally was what, for me, was kind of like, God, it would be really nice if somebody actually took the pain out of understanding my networks uh, better. So that was my big why. Now, Tara, briefly, you can just give us a, a brief background of the Tuxedo Agency, but we'd love to hear a little bit more about the, the why of, of what you do. Um, actually, well, I'm, I'm here more representing Biosphere, which is uh, some of you may have heard of. Um, and Biosphere, in the why of what I do, is all about fixing the consumer uh, brand relationship. I think it's backwards right now. We have to go to the brands. We have to spend a lot of time researching, we, and we don't know what to trust, what's out there, um, what's offered. And um, I think the brand should have to come to us and pitch us, and we should be able to pick from the best of. Thank you. And Brian with Trunk Club. Well, so the, the why is like in the heart of our mission statements. Like people don't like shopping, so we make it really easy for you to get clothes. And I think for me, there was a why at Bonobos and there's a why at Trunk Club, and they're both they're both related to what Tara just said, which is that I think it's a little backwards, and that and that people deserve. You know, a, a, a gentleman asked a really good question earlier of Steve Case about, um, you know how come those, these bigger companies can't seem to have the customer's best interest or the customer's experience in mind? And I think, I think all of us on this panel are, are people who think a lot about user experience and customer experience. And for me, like, I, I just want to make things, I want, I want to delight people with, some, with something. And I, and I think um, both building a better product in, in the trousers we made at Bonobos and then at Trunk Club, just taking the whole experience and just making it far more fun and interesting in the process of getting close. So for me, there, all the, the pain of both of those things were very personal for me. Not, not, not that it's an acute pain, like um, losing a loved one or something. It's just like, I don't want to go to the store. I don't want to, I'm tired of my clothes not looking good, you know? And so, I mean, they're really easy. They were really easy pain points, I think, for people to wrap their arms around. Okay. A question for all of you. I mean, here we are in, in Des Moines, uh, middle of the country, and uh, some people asked these questions a little bit earlier. I mean, we got you based in Palo Alto. We, we got New York. We got Chicago. Where, where are you based, Tara? Montreal. Montreal. So is it true? C can something be built anywhere? What, what is the advantage, if at all, the opportunity working on something, say, here in a Des Moines, in a Kansas City, or in Omaha, outside of the, I guess, the traditional entrepreneurial hubs? That can be for anyone. Sure, I'll, I'll start. I'll start. Um, I moved actually from San Francisco uh, to Montreal to do my startup, so I'm probably a fairly decent example of, you know, you can do it outside of the valley. Um, there are certain uh, limitations depending on where you're moving as far as access to resources. I'm going to be talking a little bit about this in my presentation tomorrow, but um, in general, uh, I think that moving out of the hot spots puts you closer to your customers at the end of the day. So that could be a really positive piece. For me also, the, the cost of doing a startup went down significantly from leaving the Bay Area to going to Montreal. Um, and there are, you know, there, there are local resources. You just, it, I think, I can't remember who was saying it earlier, maybe Steve was saying it, but it's just about building your local resources and, and making them known. Like, <laughs> 
angel organizations locally, you know, to, to open those up to startups, doing uh, accelerators locally, uh, opening them up to local uh, startups and people with, I with great ideas. And then the, I think the biggest problem for me has been um, in talent acquisition. So the, that's been a bigger challenge than money even is because people are very, ta very talented people in Montreal get drafted down to San Francisco all the time. And just as we're about to give them an offer. And even if they're getting drafted down to a company that's hardly, you know, uh, hardly funded or not very exciting, it's the fact that they're going to this exciting place. So uh, we need to find ways to keep our talent local. So going, going slightly different direction, I think what's actually really powerful is when people come from a place, they've got a unique perspective on that place. And so a lot of times I give my team crap and we sort of joke around, uh, but I look at the ecosystems in San Francisco and New York and basically the ecosystems look something like you're building a product for other people in San Francisco and people in New York, right? That's kind of how a lot of people wind up building services. Um, there are people building for non-smartphones in Africa though, and that's brilliant, you know why? Because there are millions and millions and millions of them. And so I actually think coming from environments that don't necessarily have the same set of codified assumptions about what the market needs and what the market expects to exist, um, a four square knockoff or whatever, it actually leads to interesting offerings because you've got perspective on a person, which I talked about earlier, which may be a more familiar customer and one that I would never see in a million years because I live in urban New York City. So I think there's something powerful to people building based on what they know in their unique markets. Uh, I think maybe the question be, can be turned slightly and say, can you, can you build a company anywhere? Definitely, but it's really important to remember that it takes a village. That it, uh, to get these things off the ground, it's so difficult, not only from a resources perspective, but from an emotional and psychological one. You need people that are out in front, and uh, you get a lot of that for free when you're in a place like the Bay Area, so you might have to work harder. I think that's what makes events like this so important, is uh, they can be so helpful in building relationships that can help sustain. Um, I think it's, it's very important to not go it alone. So finding, finding ways to do that wherever you are uh, is, is really important. Yeah, I would just, can I layer something onto that? B building on um, what Gentry said. I think in a, in a community that has fewer startups, you stand out as being more unique among your peers and among your family and your friends. And you also, I think you're able to garner more undivided support from the greater community. So we have had amazing support from people like the bar and restaurant community in Chicago or the, the brewery community who donates a lot of beer to us that, um, that I think, because we, we consume, well, we, we serve a lot of alcohol in, in our office and um, that, that, I think that's a good thing no matter where you are. But we, um, we, we don't have to share that spotlight with that many other people, even in a big town like Chicago. And I think that if you think about some of the massive and you know, deeply respected com companies in places like Omaha or Des Moines, you know, it's the third largest insurance capital in the world I read today after London and Hartford, Connecticut. So these are people that, you know, those are companies that have immense resources. If you can galvanize some of those companies to support you or to get excited about you, whether it's just because your wife or your husband happens to be a senior person at one of them, like I think you can get enormous amounts of tailwinds from that and you have to share that in San Francisco. In fact, that was the number one thing that I didn't really like about being there. I felt so cliche walking around San Francisco as like an urban dweller wearing Patagonia and Prada and a bit of Gucci, but pretending like I didn't have those things and then like living in Russian Hill and seeing all these other people driving three series BMWs or Audi A4s and it's just like, God, everyone's the same here. And you stand out so much more, I think. And of course, that's a, that's a, it's a unique take on San Francisco, and I've been beating San Francisco up all day. But I think that there's something really special about not having to compete with all these other people for the village support. I just, just want to add, though, on sort of on the flip side, the community around you is really important, but they need to have a basic understanding of what a startup is. Sure. And I think now we're finally getting into the place with, I mean, every second uh, magazine has a startup founder on the cover of it now that, that our friends and family really understand what we're doing. But for many years, my parents, my friends, nobody really understood exactly what I was doing and what a startup was, and they just thought I was unemployed. So, 
which is essentially true, but. Well, there's no guarantee. I'm busily unemployed. For many entrepreneurs, there's no guaranteed paycheck, I guess. Yeah. In just a moment, we'll start taking some questions here from the audience. You, you mentioned earlier uh, not going at it alone. You mentioned leveraging certain relationships. How have you guys gone about in your careers and, and different iterations of different companies about <laughs> leveraging your connectivity, your, your networks, to help you out with what you're doing? What, what, what's the best way to go about that when you have those conversations with your, with, with your network? I, I, I'm really bad at asking people. I think at the end of the day, and it's one of, one, been one of my downfalls, I'm really great at giving and you know, when somebody comes to me and approaches me. And I have an amazing network because I've been involved. Um, you, know, you say I've worked with over 30 startups. I haven't actually worked in-house at 30 startups. I worked with uh, all sorts of startups, even with uh, Facebook and SlideShare and TripIt as a consultant for many years in the Bay Area. And so uh, my network of the people that I knew, the, 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 the angels and VCs, as well as the startup founders and the startups that did really well, that could really, I could have really leveraged, um, uh, is, is pretty amazing. But I'm, I, I still need to personally, and I think it's a lesson for everybody, and I, I'll give you all my lessons tomorrow, but a lesson for everybody to like, really, this is your baby. Um, and, and if you don't believe in it, if you don't believe in it enough to leverage your network and go back to the people that you've known for many years and, and say, hey, help me out, or hey, give me some feedback, or introduce me to these people and, and really do that, then you're not going to succeed. If you can't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to. I would actually add, it's really interesting, because I think some, we, we've almost in some ways, we, we've made it sound like you gotta go ask your network this like, amorphous nebulous your network you're just gonna go beg for stuff with a cup um, and I actually think that's that's not actually what you're doing in many ways I mean I'd, I'd be curious what the rest of the folks here think but I think you want to be most successful when it's not a nebulous ask at all when it's really specific yeah I mean super specific like I've gone to a person and been like hey and you try not to be it don't make it a huge ask unless you really need to pull that favor it might be something simple like don't ask them hey so I'm trying to find uh, new potential customers to talk to and then make them do the work of being like, okay, well, what market? Who? Who do you want an intro to? Do the work for them and be like, hey, do you have one person who runs a nonprofit that you really believe in who heads up development? One. That's a simple ask and it's a targeted ask. Um, and if you've been good to them, and I think that's part of it, is, is being good to your network, yeah. they're not gonna turn you down and it's really easy for them to win and help you out if, with a specific ask. Brian, you're agreeing with the specificity. I, I thought that, that was brilliant, eloquent, exactly right. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with it 100% and I would just add maybe a really helpful framework for thinking about like, the notion of networking um, that I, that's been shared with me by somebody that, that really resonates more, probably more than anything else on the topic is, you can't hit up your network. You can't hit someone for the first time in like four or five years asking for a favor. So if you want to be able to really lean on your network, you got to stay on top of it all the time and you have to give a lot. And it's what a lot of people will, you know, there are people here that have come to give their time as volunteers and there are people that are here on stage giving their time instead of running their companies. And if you don't ever do that kind of stuff, it, I don't know if it catches up with you, but I, I certainly feel like if you do a lot of it, people really are willing to sort of pay it, pay it back. And I, I, I love that about the startup community. I think you'll find more often than not that that's one of the heartwarming aspects of being in these kinds of industries and being around these types of people. And I just think you have to embrace that. And um, if you're not someone who's really comfortable being extroverted or at least being willing to share in a way if you're introverted, introverted, forcing yourself to to look for ways to look out for other startups, then I think, I think the, you you do that over and over and over again, and things just start to really kind of fall into place. I, yeah, just to add on that, just speaking very pragmatically, uh, advisor shares and uh, sure. giving equity in general. Equity is about aligning incentives, and. Um, a Delaware C Corp is a wonderful, wonderful thing. If you're starting a company and you can incorporate it in such a way that, uh, or if you already got a company and you can incorporate it in such a way that you've got shares to give out and you can give bits and pieces to the people who you want to be involved in some way, shape, or form, what you're saying to them is, I want you a part of this. And uh, if I win, you win, so help. Uh, it's a very, very simple but powerful way of uh, getting people on board. That's a great point. I think your point, I think about what Keith Ferrazzi says, I think he says 80% of networking is actually keeping in touch 
with individuals. Uh, we have a question out in the audience. If you guys have questions, please step up to a microphone, and these folks would love to answer your question. I just want to ask Brian if I, we can hang out tonight. <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we gambling? Or are we? <laughs> there was great beer last night. Somebody, somebody bought that URL, by the way, already. Is that... Yeah, they did, seriously. So the question I have... I tried. Uh, it's gone. You're each, you're each CEO uh, within your respective companies. Wondering if you have a CEO you emulate uh, that you can share uh, or somebody that you really look up to in, the, in that role of CEO. <laughs> I mean, I've probably answered mine with how much I was dripping with love for Steve Jobs. <laughs> as long as we just take his whole personal life and defer it to. <laughs> Who do you love, Ron? Uh, I actually have come to have a CEO crush on Jeff uh, Bezos. I feel like um, he's kind of a, a sort of an unsung, not super flashy, and he is playing chess, not checkers. Like he is, I just think he's thinking steps ahead and doing the unsexy bits, looking at his own business and how he builds process as potentially extensible lines of business that he then, you know, Amazon Web Services, which we spend a lot of money on every, money on every month, came out of fulfilling a need for his own company. So I respect that immensely. Tara, any uh, CEO crushes? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if she's like the world's best role model, but Sandy Lerner, who was one of the, she was one of the founders of Cisco, but then also went on to find, uh, found uh, Urban Decay, a cosmetics company. And I just think that her diversity and her ability to run a company no matter what the basis is, is, is pretty awesome. So Reed, I can never remember which one is Hoffman and Hastings, but the guy that runs Netflix, I think Hastings. it's Hastings. Yeah. Um, I probably am most enamored with his culture presentation and we, I've, I've used that very liberal, borrowed from it liberally. Mm -hmm. I also, I'm a huge fan of Steve Case. I feel like he's, I have so much admiration for people who've been as successful as he have that seem to have a singular focus on like helping make our company, our country, sorry, a better place. We, we were really close to taking, rev, having Revolution invest in our latest round and, and the more I got to know him, the more respect I built for him. I don't know as much about what he was like as a leader, but you know, an, we all hope, I think, one day to move to the next phase where you're really giving back and I think that it's good to think about those people even earlier in your career and have them as um, as role models. So. It's amazing how uh, the CEO, I guess, icon of Jack Welch back in the day has, has kind of changed over the years nowadays. We have a question right over here. So, so I'm looking up here at the panel and it's a pretty well-dressed, suave panel that we're looking at here. Um, so some of the people that actually know me in this room will be surprised to see me in a shirt that has a collar or buttons on it. Um, and the culture that I come from, kind of from the development and to some extent creative world, uh, I actually had a developer tell me once, like, I don't work with suits, right? Like, there's this, this sort of barrier between the business world and the development world. So my question is, uh, why should I own a sport coat in my closet? I mean, I feel like I gotta take this one, right? <laughs> Where do I start? I mean, look, look the, what I always tell guys at Trump Club <laughs> when they ask me that question is, we don't, we don't want to sell you anything that you're not comfortable in. But the case that I would make is that, um, that a lot of our developers have a lot of fun getting more into fashion in that process. And I, I would simply say it's worth experimenting with. You, I, I don't think you probably, I, I don't know you, but you're, if a lot of people in the audience do, you're probably a very talented guy. And, and, and truthfully, I think there's always a risk of um, not fitting in culturally. But um, I, I think you can do it artfully, right? I think there's a way to like dress in a blazer that makes you, that's right for you without sort of trying too hard. And I think a handful of our engineers do it really well. Um, and, and you know, you've got a, a different set of, you know, I'd say both of these guys have their own take on like blazer that seems very much appropriate for them and comfortable in their own skin. And that's the thing I would say is like, if you're gonna try something like a blazer and you're like, I don't need this, Whatever you do, make sure that when you see yourself in the mirror, you're like, yeah, I like the way this makes me look. And that's sort of the, the way that we espouse sort of the, the blazer or different types of fashion that we try to push people toward experimenting with. I don't know if others want to pick this. I would up. just like it to be known that I now own whyshouldIownasportcoat.com. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever beat me to that first one, got you. I was ready to go. Any other go, takes on the, on the sport coat? I mean, I, I've heard stories about people, investors, not taking you serious when you don't come in in a t-shirt and ripped jeans. I, I would also, I mean, can I move into the personal life yeah. part of things? Yeah. Um, I don't know, uh -oh. I'm not gonna make an assumption of whether you have a special woman or man in your life, um, but, I will, but I will say that 
at some point there's going to be a wedding or a christening or some sort of special occasion to go to or a lovely dinner to go out to. And uh, not having a sport coat means that you're going to feel really uncomfortable in that situation. And there is still like a little bit of, there's, an, there's a nice, nice thing about dressing a little bit formal. I know um, when my boyfriend dresses up, I, you know, I, I appreciate it a lot. I know he's put effort into it, so that's a, that's a good reason, I think. I think the only thing I might say a little differently is you have to go, I, you know, you and I chatted a little bit um, before. If you're defining the culture for your organization, you gotta start with a, an authentic representation of yourself. I happen to like to wear blazers sometimes. Sometimes I go entire weeks where I wear a t-shirt and I'm like, tattoos out. Like, you're right, like that's, there are times where I walk into meetings on purpose on purpose, right, to set a tone for the specific meeting. Whatever you do, you gotta own it yourself. So the, the only thing I might say differently is, if you're not a blazer guy, she's right, you look really weird at christenings in a t-shirt. Um, if you can deal with that though, cool, rock it. The culture to me is the biggest thing. If your culture is defined by, you know, fa like these guys have built amazing fashion companies, of course fashion's gonna be really important to the actual fabric. Wow, I didn't mean to do that, but that's kind of amazing. <laughs> the fabric of their company, right? Um, I think for us, Expressing to people, look, rock your personal style, just show up and kick ass. That's, that's a part of our, you know, I don't care what you wear kind of thing for us. And who knows, maybe you should talk to Brian afterwards. Maybe he'll let you get that first sport coat. He'll, he'll, trunk level, you can be a customer. We can try it out. We'll see first what happens trunk afterwards. <laughs> we'll see. Let's go to the next question uh, right over here, please. Hi. Um, I would call myself an aspiring entrepreneur. Um, and one of the things I struggle with uh, that is critically important to me is keeping family first. Um, how, uh, so my question is, do you keep family first? And if so, how? Gentry, what does that look like? I mean, can, can you keep family and friends first? Uh, I, think, I think there's a question of focus for sure. I, I really liked Ron's response. I felt like I wanted to also text it to my wife when, uh, <laughs> when he was talking. But I think ha having a family that supports this and is all for it, it makes all the difference in the world. That being said, there's going to be real sacrifices in terms of time, particularly when you're trying to get something off the ground. And um, there, there are definite trade-offs there that I, I, don't, I don't know that entirely there's a way around. I think, you know, you can use the cliche, but I think it's actually true that uh, quality trumps quantity and time pretty dramatically. And if you can find the times where you can focus on family and be um, present, uh, particularly if you want to instill in your children the idea of following your dreams and working out of your passion, then uh, it's, it's time well spent, but there's, there's going to be um, trade-offs. I think an interesting observation, you know, over the past five plus years I've interviewed, I can't tell you how many CEOs and entrepreneurs for, for my business show, for, uh, for, for magazines, et cetera. And one thing that seems really clear is that there's not a, a strict divide between work and life. Like this, their companies, this is their life. So they don't seem to have a, a hard time. They're not mad when they're logging on to their computer on, on Saturday or Sunday, it's just what they do. So for you guys, is that the case that this is just how I roll? There's not work, life, this is part of who I am, my, my, the fabric of me. Uh, go ahead. No, no, you. I, I, <laughs> I think it would have been nearly impossible for me to do what I've done in the last five years if I were in a relationship, a serious relationship or with a family. Okay. The, amount of, the amount of late nights, the amount of, um, the amount of networking, the amount of just sacrifice that's, that gets made. And I, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, some, sometimes I share that with folks, like, and they'll say, that's, that's nonsense. And other times I'll share it with other friends of mine who are single CEOs in their late 30s, early 30s, late 20s, early 40s. And they'll say, yeah, like, this is just, this is my family. This is what I do. And I, I'm, I'm sure there are models or there are people who are better at managing this stuff than I am, but anyone who saw me talk knows that if, if I'm not the brightest CEO or anything else, I'm certainly one of the more passionate ones. And so I think if you carry that path, sometimes it's hard to have that passion for a lot of things outside of your career. And I, and, uh, I, I think that it's just important to apportion the amount of passion you have to the things that are super important to you. And, and you know, maybe there's a working model going forward, but I'm willing to admit that maybe having not having a whole set as a single guy without kids, um, not having had to 
share that with anyone else has enabled me to do, maybe it's enabled me to do a little bit more in my, in my work. Yeah, I appreciate that honesty. Yeah. I, I, but, I'll, but I'll say, like Sheryl Sandberg, um, I think, made a really great point. Um, and a lot of, I think a lot of women talk about this issue a lot more than the men talk about this issue. It's not that we have a different issue, it's that we talk about it more. And Sheryl Sandberg discussed this because she has kids at home. She has a husband who, with, a, with a high power career. And uh, she leaves at five. She, she makes that commitment. Um, but she also said, like, picking the right partner, um, and if you already have a partner that you love and want to keep around is, is, you know, sitting down with that partner and saying, this is what it's going to entail. Like, my work life is going to change a lot. I'm going to be focused. I'm going to be crazy and cranky at different times. Uh, I'm really blessed because, um, you know, my, my uh, boyfriend is super, super supportive um, and my, my son was old enough by the time I started down my entrepreneurial path that he was like, I don't want to spend time with you anyway. <laughs> um, so it was A-OK -okay with him. He was in his late, he was in his teens and he was awesome. like, yeah, good for you, mom. You just do your thing. Um, he sounds exactly like that too, uh, but uh, um, yeah. And, but you know, there's 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 a there's a point at which it's it's a positive thing. It, it helps you step back and actually take a better view on what you're doing. I think take, stepping away sometimes from your startup is the best focus that you can have because sometimes you're looking at the problem too, with too much min minutia, right? Um, but also, uh, yeah, having that, that supportive partner. And for me, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow again, but where uh, the, the breaking point lies is, OK, at this point, am I really ready to sacrifice my family for something that isn't moving where it should be moving? So I think it helps you make a decision because there are other people involved. Parting shot on this topic. I think the elephant in the room may be the financial question, right? Which is the, the amount of risk you, you take on if you're leaving a corporate job and, um, and not being maybe worried about supporting. And I always just tell people, you should save every penny that you earn if you ever think you want to be an entrepreneur. Because if you then have that cushion, you can take these risks. And so I mean, I think the, the easiest thing to say to an aspiring entrepreneur is like, drive a, an old Toyota and like, limit your consumption of material things which are not going to be nearly as much fun as your consumption of, of code and other things that you do if you're building something. And I, and I think that those things go hand in hand. It's, an advice, I, it's advice I offer all the time. But uh, Great advice. Let's go to the next question. Thank, thank you so you. much for that thank question, you. man. Hi, I'm Reagan from Kansas City. And I have a comment and a question. The comment is being, I'm not an entrepreneur. So to hear sort of you all speak, um, I work with CEOs every day. And so to hear you speak, it's so inspirational. And I think to see that it's not just technology, the passion, it's about the people is um, ins inspirational and a lot of leadership there. So congrats. Um, the question is, I work with a group uh, in Kansas City. And we call ourselves the Heartland Civic Collaborative, sort of um, it's not a formal organization, but we work with folks like the partnership here in Des Moines and um, the folks in Omaha and, and with the SPN folks and so our whole you know vision is creating this regional ecosystem and to help support it and build it up and really have this great um, Silicon Prairie and so from your perspectives you know, we have this framework that we're trying to use and we're looking at resources or we're looking at um, attracting the talent, the human capital piece, or we're looking at um, sort of raising the visibility and awareness um, through PR. Is there any sort of component um, that you think is more important, less important, um, should focus on, not focus on necessarily right now? Sounds like a gentry question. Really? <laughs> Still right under that bus. Um, <laughs> It's a big question. Yeah. I, I have a quick answer. The, cool. a, a reporter from the Business Journal here asked me a similar kind of question. And I, I found myself wondering if these large companies in, in the Midwest, like the Conagras of the world, or the Crafts in Chicago, or the principal financial, like, I think if they hired more people from undergraduate schools in the area, 
and then had like an up and out policy, sort of like what McKinsey does. If they were willing to sort of have like a training program that you just did it for two years and then you didn't, there's just no, like the cool thing about VCs, they hire young people and they're like, there's no way you'll have a job here after two years. So you end up going to work for one of the portfolio companies or something like that. And I, I found myself like brainstorming with this fellow, like what if, what if everybody committed that they were gonna have even more robust young person, young graduate training programs at their corporations where they were bringing in 50 and that only 25 would ever have a job after three years. Because it seems like in some of these other cities, people get, um, they get swallowed up by these big companies and they never leave because the, you know, the corporations are like, we're developing talent and we you know, want to make it. And so I found myself wondering if there's, if there's something there, if there's something to having more companies that are kind of kicking out very talented people at 26 because they have to, because they have to go get other jobs. And I'll, I'll share one of the ideas that we're exploring is we have these really large established companies and they're all across the Midwest and especially in Kansas City. And so we were talking to our CEOs about getting some of those entrepreneurs or getting them in part of that initial sort of experimentation and getting them exposed. So that's a great comment. Thanks. I might try and answer it from the other side as the, as the person coming from Silicon Valley, sort of a punching boy today. Um, <laughs> I can tell you what I, what I appreciate most about it. Um, certainly the access to talent is extremely valuable. The access to capital is wonderful. All, all of these uh, tangible pieces that are almost certainly in your framework. The piece that when I stepped away from Silicon Valley, I, I did a master's out in Nashville for a couple of years and then came back, that I found myself <laughs> missing most, and the, the piece that unfortunately is also maybe the hardest to replicate, is this collaborative culture there's a sense in which, I don't know exactly why it is, I have my theories, there's this sense in which when you meet with someone in the valley and you're talking about the thing that you're working on, there's this like, it's not a zero sum game. There's enough innovation to go around and everybody sort of assumes that. And so you meet with people and they wanna help you uh, with the assumption that sooner or later you're gonna help them as well and everyone's gonna benefit from it. It's not like trying to get the chief of police a position in Boston or something and there's only one and so you got to like slice the Achilles heel of the other guy going out for it like it's this really really collaborative environment that everyone assumes that there's enough enough whatever this resource is that we don't have to fight for it and so there's this sense that everybody helps each other do the best they can and I think what comes out the other side is part of the magic that makes the valley work and I don't know if there's ways that that can be inculcated and, and embedded into the culture here, but the more collaborative versus competitive a culture can become, I think the more in, entrepreneurial friendly it will be. It's Burning Man versus the Super Bowl. <laughs> Burning Man versus the Super Bowl? Yeah, I mean, I, if you think about the kind of events that people that are so popular and unusual in the Bay Area, a lot of them are things like Burning Man where the, the entire spirit of the event is sharing. You can't buy anything. Yeah. Right, and collaboration and creativity. Yeah, there's something, I mean, there's this running joke, no offense to Harvard, because obviously incredible, but there's this running joke that like, when you go to Stanford, everybody helps each other on their problem set, and everybody, like, I do something cool, and you do something cool, and hey, that's great, and let's go hang out and get a beer, and versus a bit of a, a, an East Coast attitude of like, if I'm meeting you at a party, I need to prove why, why I'm better than you are, or I need to kind of like put you in your place a little bit. Um, I, I've, I have found that that attitude, it ends up pushing everybody up, and it's part of, to me, what, 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 makes, uh, yeah, what makes the Bay Area work. We don't have much time left. I'll take a few more questions. Thank you for that question. Let's go right over here, please. Hi. Um, so a question earlier asked about having a family and doing a startup, and a big, big part was the financials, right? So um, earlier you were talking about product market fit and runway. Mm -hmm. How much runway do you reasonably need to be able to continue on for like six months, all right, when you're not going to make money? You know you're not going to make money for six months. How do you survive? Well, you can measure runway in two ways. You can measure it in time, and you can measure it in effectively iteration cycles. Uh, the time that you have for runway is merely a, a function of your burn rate, so how much money goes out the door versus how much goes in, and uh, how much you've got in store. And I, if you need six months, like you gotta do the math in terms of how big of a team you need and what the burn rate is and whether you can pay them in Cheerios or you need to give them salaries and, and all the rest. But the other thing I think to keep, keep in mind is if you can do these things around focus, around f lowering the cost of your early failures with prototypes, um, of putting together the right team that's really oriented for uh, building and iteration and setting up a culture that encourages that, you're effectively 
increasing the number of iterations in the same amount of runway. So it will be as if you've got a longer runway, even though the time might not change. Great. The uh, answer is uh, it depends. I mean, I want to get through. I'm sorry. Two last questions, real quick, for these guys before we run out of time. Unless you have something quick yeah, to add, Yeah, like the one thing I'd, I, I thought that was actually a great answer. I think the, the, the most salient thing to come out of that in many, way, many ways is milestones. Like pick your, to do what he just described, you got to pick actual concrete milestones, right? So if you say, there are five things I want to learn about whether or not this is something that we should be building, we'll build big, pick, force rank them. What are the two or three or four or one thing that you can actually test? in the next three months, six months, nine months, and then it becomes a money issue, but at the very least then, you know which part of your team you need to resource more, better, and you're focused, you're all working towards, we tested it, we learned, it worked, it didn't, but you all know what you're working towards. Two last questions, let's, let's go over here, then we'll come back over here. Uh, all right, uh, my name's John Schnipkoit, and I'm from uh, Cedar Rapids, which is uh, pretty close to here. Um, and my question is uh, kind of based on uh, my experience uh, on my second startup, and. Uh, a lot of the time I've spent this last summer has just been traveling around and going to other ecosystems and around, you know, in the Bay or, or wherever, in Chicago and Boulder. And really just, I think it's been great for me to not only connect with new people and, and really see how, you know, those systems are working and, and how I can just work with those people, you know, after the fact, um, but just to really appreciate maybe what makes us unique. So. Um, since you're all from different areas, what's an event in your area that you would say is like the one thing you should go to if I'm in, you know, New York or Chicago or Montreal or whatever? Great question. Definitely hit the Montreal Startup Fest next summer. Uh, people come from all over, which is ironic because it's not just Montreal, but uh, it's an amazing event, really great speakers. It's uh, very much like this one, it's over three days, lots of cultural activities as well, so. Great. We had a good tech week this year. I thought tech week was really solid in Chicago, so I'd say that would be, that's definitely something worth checking out. Yeah, we were, we were there actually, it was great. Yeah, cool. Uh, big shout to New York Tech Meetup, nytm.org, once a month. Um, NYU and a bunch of folks in the ecosystem have invested heavily in creating a great platform. Uh, technologists and investors show up once a month and it's an amazing turnout, 800, 900 people, three times oversubscribed. You can usually get a ticket and if you can't, talk to me. Sweet, thanks. <laughs> Pick everything in New York, there's a line. Just, there's just let me know road. what kind of whiskey you want. Yeah. You need a blazer to get in. For <laughs> Did you have one, Gentry? Yeah, I mean, sorry to answer your question like a designer, but I think if you want to get tap into the bay, the best thing to do is to pick a week, uh, plan to go to Soma, and write as many startups as you can ahead of time, and and, yep. and piece together exactly what you want to see, because there's so much going on that it's probably how you'll get your highest reward. Yep. Actually, Great. the Bay Area is probably the best place to go when there's nothing yeah. happening, yeah, not when there's true. something happening. Great. Surprise! No one mentioned Cleveland. Um, <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Last question over here. Yeah, uh, my name's Aaron Horn. I'm actually the founder of CanWeHangOutLater.com. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dude, we're 50-50 on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Domain names for sale. Uh, my question was, I mean, you guys are being lauded as examples of great success, obviously. Do you guys have any good epic fail moments you can share with us that uh, really taught you something or you know, a failure that you learned from? It's always a great way to end the day with epic fails. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Stick, so, 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 stick around for my talk tomorrow. It's all about that, so cool. Yeah. Brian, anything beyond your, your story that you shared earlier today? <laughs> it's pretty epic. Uh, no, not really. Okay. Right. I repeat, a man fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the reality is, from a product market fit perspective, Orchestra isn't a success yet, and we're still on that journey. So the whole thing is still an epic fail. Keep watching. <laughs> Keep watching. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up to Tara Hunt, Brian Spaley, Ron J. Williams, and Gentry Underwood. <laughs> <laughs>